All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's online event, Figure Drawing Lessons in Life Drawing with Dan Geno. My name is Sarah Allspaugh, and I want to welcome everyone to today's online event. I work in the Fine Art Department here at FNW. Today, Dan is going to give us a preview into his new book, Figure Drawing Masterclass Lessons in Life Drawing. Dan created this book to be a sequential step-by-step -step guide to help artists of all levels to learn how to render realistic figures. But before we get started, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items. Everyone has entered this webinar as a guest in listen-only mode, and that simply means that you're muted so we don't pick up noise from your end. However, you will be able to hear Dan and myself and see our PowerPoint presentation, which should be up the first slide on your screen now. If you have a question, if it's a technical question or a question for Dan, you can type those into the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel, and I'll address those technical questions as they come in, and then we'll have time at the end of the PowerPoint presentation where I can ask your questions to Dan on your behalf. So please type those questions as they come to you into the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Also, we are recording today's webinar, so if you know somebody who is unable to join us, you will receive a link to watch this recording uh, later this week, if not early next week. So please feel free to share that link with those who weren't able to join us today, um, and then just know that you will be able to re-watch this in case you missed something during today's presentation. Also, we have a special discount for you on Dan's new book, so stick around. We'll share that with you at the end of today's presentation. And that will also be coming in the follow-up email with a link to where you can buy his new book at northlightshop.com. So keep an eye out for that, and we hope you'll take advantage of that special discount. All right, let me tell you a little bit about Dan, and then I will turn things over to him. Dan Geno studied at the Santa Barbara Art Institute, the Art Students League of New York, and the National Academy of Design School. He is a professor emeritus at the Lyme Academy College of Fine Arts in Old Lyme, Connecticut, and teaches at the National Academy School in the Art Students League of New York. He exhibits regularly, both nationally and in, in New York, at locations that have included the Museum of the City of New York, the National Academy Museum, and many, many more. Uh, welcome, Dan. We're so excited to have you here today. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you. It's a real honor. Let's see, we can go ahead, here we go, okay. talk about some things we're going to talk about today. Okay, well, this is just sort of a, a general overview of the book. Um, I started writing the book uh, somewhere towards, uh, maybe it was 2002, 2003. It's a, um, I, st I started writing for Drawing Magazine in that uh, time period. And each of those articles that I wrote for them, I thought of them as a chapter in a book, because eventually I hope to uh, compile them uh, into a book. Uh, so this is the book. Uh, the, uh, the book also has some added um, features, including some extra demos and images that uh, weren't in the original book. So the, the book is, is meant to give you a um, uh, to serve as almost like a class um, in uh, drawing the figure and using it in your artwork. Um, so in, through, through the book, I talk about how to uh, begin a drawing, uh, how to get uh, a gestural uh, feeling in your work, uh, how to use line, also how to uh, draw hands, uh, create uh, a feeling of um, structure and form in your your figures. I have chapters on the head and on composition, and also on uh, how to use uh, the narrative in your uh, in your work. So the most uh, difficult thing I think for most artists, uh, especially uh, beginning artists, is uh, starting a drawing. Um, I, f I find that a lot of people um, uh, treat the beginning process of a drawing, well, they look at it um, as if every line has to be perfect. Maybe we could go to the next slide if possible. Thank you. So fear is the greatest um, 
problem that uh, most artists have, that uh, they feel that each and every line from the very beginning has to be perfect. But really, you know, drawing is really a process of revision. So it's important just to uh, start laying down lines, get a feel for the gesture of the figure. And, uh, you know, at a certain point, you start to feel where the figure should be placed on on the page and you start to see the um, proportions develop. So you can, uh, at that point, uh, erase some of your uh, initial lines uh, so that the, uh, so that the uh, drawing starts to look clean. Let's go to the next um, uh, slide, please. Thank you. So in the previous slide, I I showed uh, how I begin a drawing, which is to just move my, my pencil around randomly until I, I find the form. A lot of artists prefer to start um, with an envelope, um, which allows them to, to chart out the, the big enveloping shape of the figure. Uh, this is very useful uh, if you're trying to fit the, the, the figure on a page or in a in a small section of, of your composition. Um, I often do this myself to, um, to look at the negative shape surrounding the figure. If you uh, look at this drawing, you can see uh, how close the, the lines get to the figure. So this allows me to look at uh, the, the shape of the figure against that line. Um, so I could see, like for instance, the leg uh, how close, how much the, the leg has to go out towards the left, how much it has to go in towards the right. Um, I also often use this um, um, process to find the, uh, a sense of perspective in the figure drawing. So you can see how I use that line at the bottom uh, to set up my, uh, my feeling of space, the uh, foot in the foreground coming forward and the foot in the background. Uh, going back along a perspective line. Uh, let's go to another slide. Okay, so here, um, um, here's, a, here's another alternative way of uh, building up the figure. Quite often, well, in the previous one, we used the outside shapes. Uh, we looked for a big envelope around the figure. On, uh, in this drawing, we're looking at the inside shapes, looking at the inside angles, and how uh, one line on the figure, for instance, let's look at the uh, right leg, and you notice that the, there's a, I've drawn a line coming from the upper uh, uh, hip, and leaning it into the chest. Um, you look, when you, you, uh, you look for these angles, try to see how they line up between body parts in the figure. This helps you to establish a, uh, a, a sense of uh, rhythm. Also, uh, using, um, oh, thanks. <laughs> using these angles, um, it, it helps you to, uh, to clarify the kind of curves that the figure has. So, for instance, if you look at the, the lower left hand uh, leg, uh, I have two angles to uh, describe the curve on the back of the leg. Uh, this helps me to find where the curve actually breaks, where it changes direction. Um, it also, it, it helps to keep the artist from uh, making curves that are too uh, symmetrical or, or stylized. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, the method I probably use the most is, uh, is um, an internal line. Um, Thomas Aikens called this the line of action. And so when I first drew this figure, I, I had tried to imagine a, a kind of a general sweeping line that ran uh, from the supporting leg on the left through the spine, all the way up into the head. And then I imagine ancillary lines running off into the right leg and into the right arm. Um, so basically, I'm starting uh, usually with, uh, which is 
what is sort of a modified stick figure. Okay. It's helpful to start this way because um, when you start with a stick figure or a, kind of a modified stick figure, you're better able to judge your proportions um, and uh, you're better able to, to figure out whether the figure is uh, totally in the page. Uh, if you find that uh, you've misjudged something at this stage, it's a lot easier to erase the stick figure than, than it is to, to erase a completely uh, uh, drawn foot or, or leg. Um, okay, I guess we should go to the uh, next slide. Thank you. Now, as you're working, it's, uh, I think, very helpful to uh, think of the underlying volumes of the, uh, of the form. So you can think of the of the limbs as being made up of uh, of tapered cylinders. You can think of the um, the uh, torso, the, you know, the pelvis, and the chest uh, made up of uh, of uh, box-like cubes. The head usually can be thought of as a, a sphere. So no matter how much detail you put into your drawing, the figure really needs to to work in terms of these big form concepts first. You know, it, it, do, it doesn't really um, uh, help the figure to have uh, a lot of detail unless you, you have that sense of uh, uh, top plane, front plane, side plane, under plane. So let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Well, um, measuring is an important part of the drawing process. Personally, I, I try to do as much of the drawing as I can without measuring. I try to eyeball it as much as possible. Um, I find that if you measure too much at the beginning of the drawing, um, when you're first laying down your initial lines, uh, that it, it really scares, it, it really slows you down and kind of creates a scare factor that you're um, putting down the wrong lines. So what I like to do is try to get as much of the figure down as possible so that it feels right before I start measuring. Uh, sometimes I even look at my figures, my figure drawings in a mirror. Uh, now when you look in a mirror, um, it reverses the image. So it gives you an unfamiliar, unfamiliar look at your own drawing. When you're staring at your own drawing for a long time, uh, it's hard to see um, your mistakes. But when you look at it in a mirror, it all of a sudden reverses everything. So now you get to see it with a fresh eye. So if you happen to see some mistakes in the mirror, then I would look at the drawing and ask myself, for instance, let's say you look, you look in the mirror and you see that your head is, uh, say, 10 times too big for the, uh, the body. So then you look at your own drawing and you ask, ask yourself, is that true in the drawing? Because quite often when you use a mirror, when you look at your own drawing in the mirror, sometimes you hold it too much at an angle, which might make the head look too big in the mirror. But if you do look at your drawing and the head is 20 times too big in your own drawing, then you know you should uh, revise it. Now when it comes to actually measuring, um, so it's, it's a very complicated process. It's not as easy as um, as it looks in the cartoons where they show an artist holding his thumb out at arm's length and then measuring down the figure. Um, it's true. You need to hold your your pencil out at arm's length, and you need to keep your your uh, eye directly over your pencil as you measure. So. Um, so that uh, you don't change your viewpoint as you as you measure. Now, most people like to draw uh, like, like to measure by using head units. Uh, a head, head unit is very useful to measuring the length of a figure. Um, the average figure is about seven, between seven and eight heads tall. Um, most people are usually about seven and a half heads tall from the top of their head to their to their heel. Um, but there's a lot of variation in that. 
the most important measurement, though, are the big measurements. Um, as important as the head is, what's really important is to find the midpoint of your figure and the quarter points. Uh, these are the important ones. So when you first lay in a drawing, um, it's helpful if you decide where you want the figure to begin and end. And then if you mark off and mark off those two points, the top and the bottom of, of where you want the, the, the figure to rest. Then mark off um, the center from top to bottom and quarter points. Now, in, on average, uh, the center of the standing human figure is usually somewhere near the crotch or the um, great trochanders, which is uh, a lot of people call the hip bone. Uh, the quarter points usually um, reside just below the kneecap or on the back of the leg there's a little flexion line on just behind the knee. That's usually the, the quarter point of the lower figure. The upper figure, uh, the quarter point on, on the front is usually the nipples. So if you mark off these uh, these um, landmarks, it's helpful as you're drawing. As you get into the details of the head, for instance, uh, quite often when you're working on details, things tend to get a little bit, a little bit bigger. You know, as you start to refine, say, the nose, and you add a little bump on the nose, then you add a little extra bump on the, the lips. Before you know it, the head is is getting is much larger than you originally uh, drew it, and then. As you move down the neck, then you move, then you might find yourself making the neck a little longer to accommodate the bigger head. If you keep going in that direction, you're going to find that when you you're ready to put in, say, the nipples on the front of a standing figure, you might find that all of a sudden they're no longer at the quarter point. They're, they might even be at the halfway point. So putting in your quarter points helps you to catch a figure that's uh, getting out of proportion before you get too far down the figure. OK. Um, I guess maybe we should go to the next slide. Well, I think uh, a lot of times uh, people forget why it is that uh, they wanted to become artists in the first place. Um, you know, as we get further into uh, our uh, our education as artists, we get so caught up in learning how to draw and how to paint, how to see color, that we f that we forget what excited us to begin with. For me, it was uh, I remember when I was a kid um, looking at uh, Michelangelo's uh, paintings and drawings. I was really uh, impressed by his you know, sculptural uh, sense of volumetric form. I loved the way that you could almost feel around the forms when, I, when you looked at his paintings and his drawings. Can we go to the next slide now? Thank you. So sculptors like, uh, like Michelangelo, you know, the, the, he obviously had a fascination and obsession with volume and form. Um, so sculptors, you know, can actually make it with their hands. They can they can create a three-dimensional object out of clay and out of marble. For for a, for a painter or a drawer, uh, really, all we have uh, to create that sense that that illusion of volumetric form. All we have is uh, light and shadow. Um, so you can see uh, on the image on the left, that's a, a drawing from one of uh, Da Vinci's uh, notebooks. You know, he, he put together quite a few notebooks uh, on his theory of light and how it affects form and how to, how to de depict the illusion of uh, of form on a two-dimensional surface. On the on the right is my version of of that same diagram showing how 
a uh, spherical form um, is affected by a light source. So you'll see both in da Vinci's uh, diagram and my diagram that the the angle of the shadow on a spherical form tends to run at a right angle to the light source. It's very important to remember uh, when you do uh, complex forms like the head so that you don't end up with a head that's um, too flat or angular. Uh, so when you look at the head, say, from above, um, if the light's coming from above, you'll find shadows, or the light will will dissipate as it goes down the curve of the head. Uh, can we go to the next uh, slide, please? Thank you. Now, the arm is basically, think of it basically as a cylinder. And uh, when light hits, hits a cylinder, the shadows uh, tend to follow the directional movement of that cylinder. So you can see in this drawing of the arm that uh, there are a lot of different shadow shapes, but they all tend to run along with the, the direction of that cylinder. However, when you look at um, the more subtle subshapes, uh, like the, uh, the muscle that's directly underneath the elbow, that's kind of breaking away slightly from the cylinder because it's, a, it's just a, a little more of a slightly more bulbous shape. Let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Well, here's another example of what I was just talking about. You know, if you think of the, the overall torso, you know, the combination of the pelvis and the, and the uh, chest as being kind of a, uh, something similar to a, a tubular form, which is, you can see that the, um, the shadows are tending to follow the direction of that tubular form. But the more rounded muscle shapes are breaking away slightly from that tubular form. So, for instance, um, if you know anything about the anatomy, you can see that the latissimus dorsi just slightly uh, swings over to the right, and then below that is the um, is the rib cage, which is also being semi-spherical, swinging slightly to the uh, right. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to begin with this image uh, to talk about line was because it serves as sort of a segue from uh, uh, using light to create form, light and shadow to create the illusion of form. Uh, it creates the segue to using line, and how do you use line to create a, a sense of volume? If you look at sculptural artists like Michelangelo or some of the early drawings of Rodin, uh, you'll see that they both used line, uh, the thickness of line to advance form and the thinness of line to push form back. So like for instance, on the arm, on the deltoid, I made the line work a little bit heavier and thicker on the deltoid to enhance the sense of uh, volume and fullness. Or where the arm came in front of the uh, pectoralis, I, again, I made the line a little bit darker to help it advance in front of the, uh, in front of the pectoralis. It's important, you know, to also think about uh, the rhythm of the line, that it's uh, not too much of a dead weight line, because you can create a lot of a great deal of rhythm and, be and beauty to the line if you if you go if you vary back and forth between thick and thin, hard and soft. I tend to try to save my harder edges, harder lines for bones, like for instance on the uh, pelvis, the um, um, right right at the uh, the top of the pelvis. Um, it's called the anterior superior iliac <laughs> spine. Uh, but that projects on most people, so I, tr I kept that line a little bit stronger than the, 
the, the, the muscular lines, the, 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 then the soft tissue lines. Um, also, I wanted to uh, make the point with this uh, particular slide that um, um, you don't need to um, you don't need to you know to to finish the entire drawing to create a statement. Sometimes there can be beauty in just letting the the drawing fade into the uh, into the paper. Uh, one more thing before we leave this slide. Um, when I was talking about uh, the use of of light and shadow to create form, I forgot to talk about um, the importance of reflected light and also the importance of um, the core shadow to create volume. And you can see in this uh, image that there's a lot of reflected light on the torso. And then as you move towards the um, uh, towards the light, there's a slightly darker shadow edge. Now that darker shadow edge is called the core shadow. That's the part of the shadow which is getting very little reflected light and no direct light. That's an extremely useful device to creating a corner, cornering effect on the figure to help turn the planes, from, help turn the form from one plane to the other, or in this case from the uh, back plane to the side plane. And then that little bit of reflected light towards the uh, left helps to bring out the front plane. Okay, let's, let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So as you're, as you're working, whether you're using um, uh, value masses or line, it's very important to uh, think of the underlying basic structure of, of the figure. As we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you can think of the pelvis and the ribcage as, as kind of uh, um, box-like and the limbs as cylinder-like. Now, you don't want to actually draw boxes and cylinders on the figure, but if you look for um, bilateral landmarks, that helps you to create the sense of a box-like form. Like, for instance, here I've, I've indicated with uh, some lines uh, the bilateral relationship between the, uh, the, uh, the nipples and then also the um, where the, the chest starts to turn inwards. I've also uh, indicated the bilateral landmarks uh, across the top of the uh, pelvis. Just putting in those two spots uh, helps the, the viewer to kind of visualize or feel the illusion of uh, volume. So it's always important to try to find areas in the body uh, that have some kind of a bilateral relationship. Oh, another thing to to think about when you when you when you're um, you're thinking in these uh, broad terms, the center line is very important. So, in the case of this um, of this chest, uh, you see how I have the center line in perspective. It's very important to put the, the center line in your drawings um, before you get too far in, into the details because this helps you to determine um, the, the sense of size of the near forms against the, 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 um, the forms that are further away. Okay, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I, I, have find, I find that often um, uh, students when they're first when they first begin learning how to draw and that this includes me um, we all tend to focus too much on the outside line of the figure trying to get it perfect without thinking about the inside third line so we have like two outside lines for the outside of the, of the figure and then an inside third line that third line basically is where the form breaks or if it's a um, in the case of the um, this uh, torso here on the right, we have the light coming from above and this and behind. So the back, the shadow breaks at the at the plane break where we go from uh, back plane to side plane. 
this third line really helps to to create the feeling uh, illusion of, of form because in the case of this uh, torso, that third line is the nearest plane to the viewer. So without that uh, that edge, it would be very hard to create a sense of uh, volume. Now, when I first put in the third line, I usually don't fill it in with shadow. I usually just very lightly sketch in the um, the shape of that uh, shadow edge, which is called the terminator. That's where light terminates. So I, I vaguely, I, I, I very loosely and lightly put in that uh, that third line, and then I look at it and see how it relates to the outside outside lines. Quite often, it when I once I put in that third line, I start to see drawing problems that I, that I didn't notice before when I uh, when I first put in those outside lines. Uh, one way to visualize how important this third line is, uh, you know, try to visualize drawing a, a box or a set of stairs without, without that cornering edge. It would be almost impossible. OK, I guess we should go into the next slide if, if we can. OK, it's a lot easier you know, to, to create a sense of uh, volumetric form when you have really strong light and dark shapes where the shadow is very, uh, very distinctive, like in those, as in those last uh, two drawings. Now, it's much more difficult when you have the light behind you and the figure is flooded with light. In those cases, what I try to do is I try to squint. And I try to see what kind of big shape does the half tone make. So for instance, in this uh, particular drawing, when I squinted, I could see that the top of the shoulders and the um, top of the uh, chest, back of the rib cage, was, was relatively light compared to the, the chest as it turned under. So I, you know, I, I try to harmonize those values into a broad shape to help uh, create the sense of uh, the big planes, the big planes moving in and out. Notice too how on the arm I uh, harmonize the half tone uh, values in the lower arm compared to the upper arm, which helps to create a step back quality between the upper and the lower arm. Now, in this uh, drawing, I also used. Um, uh, line weight to help uh, create a sense of form. Um, you'll see um, Manet doing this a lot in his paintings. Um, quite often, uh, he painted people with uh, f fully lit, um, and so all he really had had was really the outside edges to create a sense of form. So in the case here, uh, what I was doing was I accentuated the, the dark edge of the shoulder to help bring it in front of the um, trapezius. Or in the case of the elbow, I slightly ac accentuated the, um, the crease above the elbow of the, uh, of the arm to the help bring the elbow out. Then if you look downwards uh, towards the, the foot, I purposely softened uh, the values and um, uh, sketched in the, the line work much more loosely and vaguely to help create a, a feeling of the leg sitting further back in space. OK, I think we could go to the next slide. Now, one of the, the th this is a very important concept that uh, I wanted to talk about. We want, you want to be careful that w when you use line to create form, you don't use it too rigidly, that you don't uh, box in your figure completely. Um, you can actually create a lot of uh, feeling of closure just by putting in a, a few uh, lines here and there. So like, for instance, there's almost no detail uh, where the, the figure is seated at, at, at the lower part of his pelvis. But I think you probably know where he's seated just based upon the other lines. The, uh, that lead up to that area. Notice too how uh, I left the uh, the, the back, 
So I left the, my drawing of the back much uh, looser and more vague along the left compared to the right, since I wanted that whole area of the figure that was nearest to me, I wanted it to come forward. So I left both the back, the, the far left of the back and that uh, left leg pretty vaguely uh, drawn. It's important you know, to consider the feeling of air that resides within the drawing. And if you outline the, the figure too rigidly, um, then the figure doesn't breathe within that page. So if you leave open spaces here and there, as I did in the lower part of, the, of, this, of this figure's torso, if you leave certain areas open, then it allows the, the air of the paper to breathe into the figure. OK, I think it's time for the next one. Um, tone paper is very useful uh, for creating uh, form. Um, it actually can be used for your half tones. A lot of people, when they use tone paper, they treat it almost as if they're working on white paper, where they, they render the shadows and the half tones with uh, their dark pencil. When I use tone paper, I try to stay away from the, the, the half tones with my dark pencil. Rather, I try to uh, block in the lights with a white pencil. So I try to think of the white pencil almost like um, light itself. So where the, the planes are turned more towards the light, I press a little heavier with my white pencil. As they turn away from the light, I press a little bit uh, with, with a little bit less pressure until finally um, I use less and less pressure until finally the gray paper um, is revealed as a form of halftone. The other thing I'm doing here in this uh, drawing is I'm merging the shadow uh, of the figure into the shadow, into a shadow of the background. You don't have to put a lot of detail into a chair to infer that somebody is sitting in a chair. You also don't have to put a lot of detail into the background to infer that there's uh, a a great deal of air and space around the figure. Sometimes all you need to do is just have the shadow of the figure blur into a shadow of the background, as I, as I did here in this drawing. So can we, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Well, you know, when you, after studying the figure for a long time, um, you want to start uh, using it for something. Um, now, in my case, I, when I was a kid, I was very interested in uh, comic books. I enjoyed the the idea that you could tell stories with uh, the human figure. So, uh, as I was learning how to draw the figure, I was uh, also concentrating on how to uh, create a sense of action in the figure because I wanted to eventually tell some kind of story or narrative with my, my artwork. So one of the ways uh, to, to learn how to draw the figure in action is, is really to learn how to, how to draw it out of memory. Um, so uh, so when, I, when I was young, I <coughs> would take my gesture drawings, and I would uh, come home and draw those, uh, those drawings from memory. And I would keep drawing them from memory until I could just draw them out of my, completely draw them out of my head. I was trying to build up a, um, you know, a syntax of, uh, of uh, um, visual form of the figure. Uh, but when it comes to trying to do something realistic, um, you usually need to work from the figure. Uh, and in order to do so, you have to figure out um, how to uh, prop the figure so that uh, the model can keep a, a strenuous pose for a long time. So in the case of this figure, um, we had the, the model uh, with one leg up on a, um, on a stool, and uh, his hand was grabbing um, 
if I recall, he was grabbing a stick, and then the other hand was uh, was grabbing a, uh, a tripod off in the distance. You can also use photography to to try to capture action poses, but um, when it comes down to it, it's, working from life is the best way to get a a sense of uh, volume in your figures. So when you're working from f photographs, the the camera having only only one eye tends to see things more flat than the human eye does. So even if you're using photographs, it doesn't hurt to have the model take that pose every now and then in real life, so you can visualize those forms in in its full three dimensions. <coughs> Okay, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Well, here's an example of uh, really good narrative art. This is by Henri uh, Domier. Um, now, when you start getting into narrative art, it's um, it, it can get very expensive if you want to try to get uh, more than one figure posing at the same time. So usually, most people, uh, most artists, do one figure at a time. And maybe they have them come back every now and then um, to pose. So you might start with one figure, the next day start, uh, start working on the next figure, the day after that go back to the first figure. Um, but in doing this, in going back and forth between uh, two different models, it's important to try to think of where your eye level is as the artist. So that you can you uh, maintain a consistent eye level in the composition. So in the case of this uh, of this image, if if Domier ha had been using uh, figures, which he probably wasn't, because I think he worked a lot from his memory. But if you were doing this scene from life, uh, it looks like the artist's uh, um, viewpoint is basically at the level of uh, the woman's eyes. So you might be seated uh, drawing her. If then you wanted to paint or draw the, the figure that was standing at the podium, you'd have to stay seated and have the figure stand in front of you so that you, you could get that view of looking, looking up at, at him. OK, let's, let's go to the uh, next slide. When it gets really complicated, like this uh, painting by uh, uh, David, uh, it really helps. After you've established your eye level, it really helps to then establish a key figure, uh, one figure that you can measure all the other figures against. So for instance, if your eye level is, say, at the uh, level of the waist of the standing figure, um, then um, all the other standing figures will be basically at that same um, their, their waists would all be at that same level. Um, also, you notice that uh, um, David is using uh, lighting very effectively to um, create a sense of mood. And also, to, uh, he's using lighting shadows to help create a sense of harmony in the um, in the image. So even though he has quite a few figures in this composition, the shadows are connecting them, blurring them together, especially off at the, the right. The, the bright light on the uh, figures are also um, serving the same purpose, you know, connecting the figures together in the big light abstract shape. So this, this composition then becomes interesting not just as a narrative but also as a abstract design now in your own in your own um, home I just lost my computer what happened uh, well I'm still here so I don't know if your feed okay I, I got it back I'm sorry oh, that's okay uh, I got yeah, my, my computer went to sleep. Okay. Well, we have a thunder. Sorry about that. We have a thunderstorm here, so I got nervous that I lost connection or something. But I'm still connected. <laughs> I think we're good. To okay. Keep going. <laughs> okay. I'm really sorry about that no uh, interruption. Um, okay. I, uh, 
when you're trying to set up your own light at home, it's uh, it's important uh, to use a light that is uh, color corrected because it can really affect your sense of color when you're um, when you're painting. In uh, in my studio, I use a um, a um, it's called a CFL. That's that's a uh, fluorescent light bulb. It's one of those curlicue light bulbs. I use a um, hundred watt uh, CFL rated at 5,000 Kelvin. 5,000 Kelvin is basically the the color of north light, uh, which is what uh, artists like uh, David uh, painted under, and that's also uh, the kind of light that I learned how to paint under when I was going to uh, going to art school. Uh, the, the nice thing about the 5,000 Kelvin is that it's a it's a, it's a, w a white light. That is, it um, it allows you see, to see the colors uh, in their true um, true condition. If you're working under an incandescent light bulb, it's very hard to see that you uh, it's very hard to see the warm colors that you're using. The incandescent light bulb is very hot. So if your painting is, is lit by an incandescent light bulb, you don't really notice that you might be using too much orange. Uh, one way to, if, if you use an incandescent light bulb, one way to uh, adjust the color of the incandescent is to use uh, a theater filter um, made by a company named Lee. It's uh, number 203. It's a blue filter that you can put over your, um, your light bulb. Can we go to the next uh, slide, please? Thank you. Okay, this is a painting I did. Um, I was trying to create a, uh, I call this the uh, nightmare triptych, and I was trying to basically create a, a sense of, a nightmarish sense. So uh, I put the light uh, at the bottom of the, um, on the floor to create a kind of uh, scary, nervous uh, light. Um, I also um, try to um, play up a uh, kind of extreme uh, three-point perspective to uh, create a, a kind of unsettled quality in the image. You see this a lot, this kind of lighting and this kind of perspective, you see a lot in uh, the early German expressionist films, uh, films uh, People like uh, Fritz Lang. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, these uh, this um, these sketches on the left uh, show some of my um, an initial thoughts on building the composition. The the sketch on the lower left is the uh, beginning sketch for the uh, painting that we just showed. Uh, you can see how loosely I begin a, uh, a drawing um, for, for the painting. Really just thinking about the sense of space in the, uh, in the room, um, looking at how shapes uh, line up and connect on a bigger abstract level. Um, the, the painting on the right, uh, which is the second part of this triptych, um, has an upraised uh, arm. Now that's very hard for anybody to hold for any length of time. In the case of this painting, I, I had uh, my model, uh, who also happened to be my father, uh, and he liked to pose for me. I had my my uh, father put his uh, his wrist on a tripod so that he could keep that pose uh, for quite a while. Okay, let's go to the next um, slide, please. The drawing on the uh, the right um, was a drawing that I did while I was um, painting my uh, painting of the the nightmare of uh, the man sitting on a chair. And I, as I was painting the uh, that image, I had some second thoughts about where I wanted to place the briefcase, how I wanted the hand to to sit on the briefcase. So. So even though I had already started the painting, I I went back and did uh, quite a few uh, sketches of of that hand. 
uh, just to uh, decide how I wanted to uh, um, to render the finished uh, painting. Well, um, now this leads into uh, a very important subject. Probably the most important subject uh, is the idea that you need to keep practicing, no matter how good you get as uh, as an artist. Um, because none of us, or at least most of us, are not uh, are not born with a lot of inbred talent. And, and many people who are born with a lot of eye-hand coordination, um, for them, quite often, drawing is just so easy that they forget that they need to practice all the time. And then, if you don't practice, you lose your ability to put your pencil where you want it to go. So it's extremely important to keep practicing no matter what. You know, every day, it's it's important to practice as much as you can. If you can do uh, at least an hour a day, or even 10 minutes a day, whatever it is you can set aside, the more practice you, more practicing you do, the more 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 momentum you build up, and the faster, quicker you get better. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, thanks. So wherever you go, you can find something to draw. Um, you could draw a friend uh, reading a book, like like here. This is uh, a drawing by Jerry Weiss, who's extremely uh, uh, he's a wonderful painter and a great drawer. Can we go to the uh, next slide? Or, you know, if you're commuting, you could draw people on the train as uh, Marvin Franklin did here. Um, he was an incredibly prolific artist. He uh, he worked um, for the subway. Uh, and at the same time he worked for the subway, he was also studying at the Art Students League full time. And he spent a lot of time traveling to and from work and to and from uh, the league. But he didn't waste his time um, as he was traveling. He, he, did, he just filled hundreds of notebooks of these uh, sketches of people um, sitting in the subway. Okay, can we do uh, go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, it's important to uh, to to draw people in everyday um, um, everyday situations, but it's also important to keep up your uh, figure sketching. So again, no matter how good you get, it doesn't hurt to at least. Uh, Go to a sketch group at least once a week, you know, to keep up your eye-hand eye coordination, to keep up, keep up your sense of of, um, of volume and rendering. And especially if you're interested in anatomy, it's very helpful to keep working from life as much as possible. Okay, so I guess that's that's it for that part. <laughs> Do we have some questions? Okay, sorry, I had to unmute myself here. Thank you so much, Dan. That was great. So many great tips Thank you. and uh, things that you shared with us from your book, and it was so nice to get a little peek inside. Um, here we have the discount for you guys if you want to save an extra 10%, who wouldn't want to, off of Dan's book and ebook at northlightshop.com. You can enter the coupon code GENO10 upon checkout. And then now we have some time for your questions, so please type your questions into the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. And um, let's see here. The first question comes from Thomas, and Thomas asks, "Do you have a preferred? Do you have preferred drawing tools and brands?" Yeah, actually I do, <laughs> and that brings up a very complicated uh, uh, topic, which is that uh, um, when you find a really nice pencil or paper, you can just you can just bet that they'll stop making it. So, <laughs> um, 
one of my favorite uh, one of my favorite tools to draw with is um, it's called a Stabilo original color pencil. It's uh, series 87. Unfortunately, it's not available in the in the United States, at least not anymore. Um, they still make it and distribute it in Europe, but um, it gives you a very clean line. Um, it's easy to sharpen and it's easy to uh, easy to erase. But you know, if you want to try try it out, um, you there's really almost no way to do that unless you happen to visit uh, Europe and pick up a couple of pencils there. If you do, I would really uh, pay close attention to the numbering system on the pencil because Stabilo makes a lot of different pencils. And I'm not talking about the Stabilo uh, old ALL series or their pastel pencils. I'm talking about their color pencils, which all of them start with the number 87. I use the color, uh, most of the sanguine drawings were done with a pencil that's uh, number 87655. That's a sanguine color. Uh, I also like uh, using um, uh, charcoal pencils. I, I like um, a Wolf's carbon pencil and uh, General's, uh, carp, uh, General's charcoal pencil. They uh, recently uh, made a special order of uh, a very hard charcoal pencil, a 2H. Um, you could find them in a few art stores. But uh, usually the hardest pencil you could find by generals is usually their HB. Uh, Ritmo makes a good charcoal pencil. I, I like using their, their uh, B grade pencil. For my softer um, um, drawings, I use um, uh, a, cr a credit color um, sanguine. It's, um, let's see if I could find the, uh, the number of it. Well, let's see. Okay, the oil based one is, uh, oh, where is it? 46202. And then the pastel based one is 46212. And you can use them at, you can buy their uh, pencil version or their they have a version, uh, a stick version that you can put into a uh, into a pencil holder. Okay, cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, Hen Henrik asks, which minimum size of paper is important to practice on? Is A3 enough? Is what? I'm sorry. Is what enough? A3. I'm not sure. Size of paper. Uh, well, uh, what I usually use is 18 by 24, um, which doesn't mean I use the whole page. Um, sometimes I turn the pad sideways, so I'm really just uh, drawing up the 18 uh, length. But when I do anything that's, say, 20 minutes or over, I, I like to use the whole uh, 24 length. These are just for sketches. I, this wouldn't be for, say, a, a large scale drawing. But when I'm just practicing, I, I like to work at 18 by 24. And I have two kinds of paper that I really enjoy working with. One is a, um, a bond paper. Um, it's kind of uh, slick, so it allows me to you know, be um, um, smooth with my tones when, I, when I'm using the, uh, the uh, chalk, uh, the, the chalk uh, crayon. Um, it's made, I'm trying to remember what who makes it. Uh, oh, it's uh, Borden Riley number 39 layout. And then I also use uh, something which is uh, called Sketch. It's made by, um, made by uh, Canson. It's uh, 50 pound. And that has a little more of a tooth, uh, but not so much that it uh, inter interferes with the uh, smooth tones. With my uh, my tone paper, I like to use um, a brand called Artigan. It's very uh, the paper is very strong, very smooth. Uh, it takes a lot of abuse. And if you do a drawing on one side that you don't like, you can just turn the paper around and do another drawing on the other side. And uh, the paper is so thick and strong that um, 
none of the pencil lines show through from the other side. Okay, cool. Thank you. Hopefully that answers your question there, Henrik. If not, um, you can type it in again, but I think that was what you were looking for there. Uh, this next question comes from Paula. Paula asks, when drawing a model wearing clothes or from photographs, what do you recommend so that one doesn't lose the structure of the figure? Well, I think it's important, uh, you know, whether you're drawing somebody clothed or nude, to always think about the underlying um, form concept below the surface. So if you're drawing an arm, whether clothed or nude, I, you know, I always think about, uh, I always think about this, the underlying cylinder. Then, then where it becomes complicated with clothed figures is that you know the the um, folds uh, shift a lot you know between poses or even as the person's breathing or maybe they might scratch their nose in the middle of the pose and all the folds are different. Um, so in that case, I look for the structurally important folds, and these usually occur around uh, uh, the points of of compression on the figure like the, the armpit or the, um, the inside of the arm. Um, so you have several kinds of folds. You have folds of compression, like I just mentioned. Uh, you also have folds of tension. So if uh, somebody's reaching forward with their arm, there may be a, the, the material may be pulled tightly from the shoulder to the wrist. So that's a fold of tension. Then you have fold of gravity. Uh, folds that hang from a high point, like uh, you know, if you look in the mirror and look at your arm and look at if, if you're if you're wearing loosely fit fitting uh, shirt, you may notice that uh, there's a pendulous fold that hangs from the top of your shoulder and then kind of tucks in or down into a fold of compression at your at your at the um, at the uh, the bend of your arm. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if you guys have other questions, I think I got to them here. Um, type them into the question section, and I'll uh, relay those to Dan really quickly. Um, otherwise, all right. Here comes one more from Richard. Richard says, "Do you have a color formula for painting flesh tones that you would be willing to share?" <laughs> that really that. I mean, I have I have ways of, of approaching um, uh, flesh tone or or really any object, but it always varies depending upon the the light source, the uh, reflected light, the the kind of mood you're trying to create. Um, I would say that my main way of approaching uh, uh, flesh color is. Um, is that often I start with a red, usually a, a earth red, like uh, like light red or now light red is not cadmium red. That's it's it's an earth red. It's um, it's a lot like um, sanguine. So I'd start with a light red or burnt sienna, which is also an earth red. And then I might add a little white. Now this is for the lights. I might add a little white, and then I might add a little bit of 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 green to neutralize the red a little bit. Um, so basically, I'm working with um, um, complements. So if, if if as I'm working the the, uh, the figure gets too red, then I add a little more green because the complement is green, and and complements will neutralize each other. If the figure starts getting too green, then I'll add a little bit of uh, of the uh, the light red or burnt sienna. And along the way, you might want to add a little bit of yellow ochre or raw sienna, depending upon the complexion. Uh, but this is just one of many ways to approach uh, mixing the uh, colors of the figure. You could easily use any of the other um, uh, complements, like orange and blue is a very uh, uh, powerful combination to use when painting the figure. Uh, especially if you're painting the figure under um, um, uh, tungsten light. Okay. 
Um, and then Mary asks, can you say more about harmonizing? Say more about what? Harmonizing. Harmonizing? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I mean, that, that kind of goes into so many different uh, areas between uh, we could be talking about harmonizing your line work, harmonizing your values, uh, your colors. Uh, but in general, uh, when I, I, I draw the figure um, from a tonal point of view, I try to squint to look at the big value relationships that run through the figure so that um, the, when I do the detail of the shadow, the, the details of the shadow stay subordinate to the overall unified shadow mass. The same thing with the, the half tones. You have to be very careful when you, you start rendering half tones that you don't go too dark or too light in the half tones you know, and, and, and break the, the sense of unity within the big half tone mass. Uh, so for me, you know, unity, harmonizing, um, it's, it's a big subject, but it, a lot of it just comes down to trying to find you know, the big abstract shape that runs through the figure and, and the environment. All righty. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for doing this, Dan. I really appreciate you taking the time um, to show us a little bit from your new book. And I really do hope everyone will go pick that up. I know some of you are saying you already have it. Um, hey, maybe you can pick up another one at the low rate <laughs> gift. There you go. <laughs> um, hey, it's good to have an well, ebook version and a hard copy, you know. Anyway, uh, for those of you who don't have it, be sure to pick it up at northlightshop.com and use this coupon code. And again, we were recording today's session. So if you know somebody who was unable to join us, feel free to share this with them or post it on your social media or wherever you want to share it um, with your fellow artists because there's lots of great information in this webinar today. So thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Dan. And we hope to see you guys all at another Artist Network event soon. Thank you very much. It's been a real honor and pleasure to, uh, to do this. Thank you. All right. Well, have a great day, everyone, and uh, go create. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.